From the Scripps School of Journalism in the Schoonover Center in Athens, Ohio, this is Gen Z up to the ballot. Welcome to the third edition of Gen Z Up to the Ballot. I'm your host, Reese Thompson. It is exactly two weeks since Election Day as the country prepares for former President Donald Trump to return back to the White House. And people have a wide range of feelings about the results. In a national election heavily focused on women and reproductive rights, women in the U.S. have faced an onslaught of online abuse following Vice President Kamala Harris's loss. The Institute for Strategic Dialogue found a spike of misogynist posts around Election Day between November 4th and November 7th used to harass women on online platforms like X, forums, blogs, Reddit, and YouTube. The most common phrases include, quote, your body, my choice, posted over 12,000 12, times on November 8th. The second most seen phrase is, quote, repeal the 19th, the amendment that gave women the right to vote, posted over 1,400 times on November 6th. And, quote, get back to the kitchen, posted at a peak 1,200 times, also on November 6. Women are standing up to the uproar of female-targeted online hate. A radical feminist movement that originated in South Korea is sparking interest in the United States after Trump's win. Known as the 4B movement is a pact of women who refuse to date, marry, have children, or any romantic encounter with men. Liberal women on TikTok started to participate in their own version of the trend after disappointment about the election results. Google reports the number of women interested in the movement jumped from 2 to 100 people post-election. In over 500,000 search and queries, for the 4B movement on Google in the span of 48 hours. The trend stems from the wake of the hashtag MeToo movement in 2018 as a way for women to protest misogyny and violence against women. The focus of feminist movements has drastically changed over the years, forming during the suffrage movement in the mid-1800s to modern feminism, but the formal definition has stayed the same. The Oxford Languages Dictionary defines feminism as the advocacy of women's rights on the basis of the equality of the sexes. But does this definition apply for everyone? I asked women on Ohio University's college campus their definition of feminism. Here's what they said. Actions and the morals that uplift women and especially in areas where women are underrepresented or our rights are really taken for granted. Women coming together and supporting each other and having like a community within themselves. Feminism is community. Like if you're not looking out for other individuals in your community, then you can't exactly be a feminist. The World Economic Forum also reports Gen Z women are less likely to be financially literate than Gen Z men. They are also less likely to be confident in their finances. Only 5% of Gen Z women say they have more than enough money. My last question is, how does the rising number of women in the workforce change their confidence about their own financial stability? Equal lives, meaning that everybody has the same chances to the same opportunities and has access to the same rights. So I think that you do need equal rights in order to have equal lives. Because feminism is so tied to like gender binaries, we do try and fit ourselves into these roles and we try and fit ourselves into these social roles that we're always like needing to fill. Um, and feminism is pushing back on that and so when we push back on that it in some way confuses us because if we are not fulfilling the roles that are already established then what are we trying to do joining me now to talk about the future of gen z is fellow journalist tania stevens tania thank you so much for joining me today i know you've done a lot of coverage on gen z she actually had her own podcast where she talked to gen zers and how they're um 
their lifestyle has been generally. So I want to ask, you've learned a lot about Gen Z's priorities. Like I said earlier, a lot of them are trying to find a work-life balance. Why do they care about this more than previous generations? I think that the, the reason why they, they talk about it so much is because they're tired of hearing other generations talk down on them. You know, a lot of generations see they're so lazy and all they want to do is be on TikTok and all these different things. And I think that fuels the fire for a lot of Gen Zers to be like, well, actually, no, we do work. We are entrepreneurs. We are people who are really are willing to work. We just have a different way of doing it. And so I think... Uh, Multiple generations I've had on my podcast have always talked about that they see the, the work e effort differently, but there's still a work effort just in a different way than viewing it. Gen Z is the most college, has the most college graduated level of people in that generation. Where do you see their priority shift? Do you see them caring more about jobs over having families? I feel like they're caring more about just how to live. I mean, they talk about a lot that you know inflation is 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 the important thing that they talk about it's a conversation that everyone talks about so obviously having families and stuff of that nature but also just the will to live the work effort to live and just getting money in their pockets so they're able to have a family and have able to afford these types of things for a you know a good stable life the World Economic Forum reports that over 20% of Gen Zers say they would consider other jobs if employers aren't engaged in social issues such as feminism that we've been talking about earlier. Why is this so important to Gen Z in the workplace? Um, I think in the workplace, I just I think that they just don't want to be as like example, hearing the word feminism or hearing feminist, I think that conversation is talked about because women don't want to hear that you know only a man can do this. Um, and our generation, we're very vocal, we're very upfront with how we feel, and we, we don't want to take anything uh, like it's slap in our face type of thing. So I think in the workplace and hearing that quote um, that, you know, fuels, like I said before, fuels that fire they want to do more to, to show like, and prove that they are able to do it. Almost 30% of Gen Z women cited better advancement and growth opportunities as a reason to leave a job compared to only 22% of men said this. Do you think that this is because women are now more driven than men to be uh, become a part of the workforce? Yeah, absolutely. Like I said before, I think hearing it and seeing it that, you know, women, I've had women, I had women on my show this summer, of a uh, past summer about the fact that they're being their own entrepreneurs because they are tired of hearing that only a man can do this. So being in that workforce where it's not just, you know, sitting pretty, but they're actually getting to the grind. It's, it's a proven point that they are able to do it. They're able to be in the same room, be at the same table as a man and do more. Yeah, and companies that provide stress-related perks such as health offerings stand a better chance of recruiting Gen Z workers to their company. What does this say about Gen Z standing their ground in the workforce compared to other generations like you were saying with trying to prove as a woman that they deserve to be in the same jobs and placements as men? Yeah, um, it's said before and it's stated all the time that our generation is very vocal. Uh, we do not like to be talked down to, and we have the capabilities with the resources that we're able to use. Um, and it just it shows a lot that our Gen Z just wants to do more for themselves and for the next generation, for the people around them. Yeah, that's all the time I have. But thank you so much, Shania, for joining me. I really appreciate it, and thank you for your insight. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Coming up next on Gen Z Up to the Ballot, how Gen Z is feeling two weeks after the election results were announced. We'll hear from an economist and Gen Zers with special reports from Shane Scalfaro and Sullivan Beach. Stay with us. Every day, thousands of kids start vaping. And I can't let this happen to my kid. Of course, it's awkward to talk to your kids about the dangers of vaping. Hey, bestie. How sketch is me? It's hard to get their attention. Ready? Go. Yes. Look at that. Yeah, you, you didn't even turn yours over. So if you want to talk to your kids about the dangers of vaping, you got to get it trending. No, you're doing it wrong. Let's go. <laughs> Can we talk? Yeah, what's up? <laughs> Visit talkaboutvaping.org for tips on when and how to have the vape talk.
you need to do something to feel okay to drive, you're not okay to drive. Don't drive buzzed. When I was in foster care, I never knew when I would have to move. So I always had my suitcase ready to go. Then one day, I was adopted. My new parents opened their hearts and home to me. My parents cook my favorite breakfast for me every morning. My parents take me on trips I never thought I would go on. They gave me a home and an even better reason to use that suitcase. My parents aren't perfect, but they're perfect for me. Welcome back to Gen Z Up to the Ballot. The presidential election wreaked havoc on mental health, with Gen Z impacted the most. This is also known as election anxiety. Reporter Shane Scalfaro talked to local Gen Z students at Ohio University about how they are handling their own str stress post-election. Yeah, at least once the election comes around, emotions tend to get high. Now we're two weeks removed from the election, and the only question left is, where are we now? According to a survey from Forbes Health by Talker Research, Gen Z was said to be the most anxious and stressed generation when it came to the 2024 presidential election. But what exactly has caused so much toil for Gen Z when it came to voting in this election? I mean, there's a lot of it like, at stake. Um, you know, climate change, women's rights, a lot of important things. For lack of a better term, it's like do or die. The frequency of tragic events unfolding like more and more and more as time goes on and now that we actually can vote and do something about it. While there was so much stress and anxiety among Gen Z voters, not all felt the same way. I try to not let it impact my feelings and my, my base uh, emotions. Uh, so when I go out, I try to keep it as stress free, as anxiety as free as possible. So I just, I go into it with like, I've already made my decision and I'm just gonna, you know, pull my vote. So now that the election is over, where is Gen Z now and how have those emotions changed? I'm just trying to enjoy the last couple of months that we have and then, you know, if it hits the fan next year, then it does. Um, so yeah, I, it feels surreal, so I haven't really, I don't think processed it much since then. At first it was kind of like a panic, like, oh my God, but now it's kind of like, all right, we need to prepare. <laughs> and the hope is with changes, some of that stress and anxiety can be relieved in future elections. I think if we can work together to make media and the news um, programs more transparent uh, through their studies and their findings and like what they're breaking to uh, people, especially through social media, to help reduce that stress in the younger generation. Well, there you have it. While Gen Z was stressed about the election, the focus has now shifted to preparing for whatever comes in the future. Reporting for Gen Z Up to the Ballot, I'm Shane Scott Farrow. Back to you, Reese. Thanks, Shane. We'll see how that stress and anxiety continues to go down. Gen Z Up to the Ballot reporter Sullivan Veach was on College Green and spoke to students about their opinions on Donald Trump's economic policies and their general feelings about the election. Hi, I'm Sullivan Beach, and with the election now over, I'm here on College Green to ask Gen Z students about their general feelings and thoughts after the election. What are the vibes like on campus? I'm here to find all of that out. Which the general that? feeling is negative. Yeah. And my general feelings as well would be negative, just based on like more like social opinion and that sort of stuff. I think since the, the Democratic candidate for this term was so focus on Gen Z and you know really targeting that younger audience they they lost a lot of other people within that process and unfortunately Donald Trump just his statements were broad enough to appeal to many people I feel like a lot of people are upset uh, but more specifically the queer community has really taken this uh, recent election as a hard blow to their uh, esteem and their morale but uh, even in like a time like this I've definitely seen a lot of hope and a lot of organization uh, spring up. I also spoke to students about their opinions on Trump's tariffs and economic policies. I asked them, do you think his plan to use tariffs on other countries is a good idea? How will that affect business in the United States? And here's what they said. I, I don't think it's a good idea because it's it's just gonna cause even more inflation and even more problems within economics if you're charging for more from other countries it just doesn't 
makes sense how that would add up. Right. I feel like everybody is kind of despising these tariffs right now, especially people who voted for him. I feel like it's going to take a major hit to the economy, and overall, like, it's not in our best interest. You've heard what Gen Z students have to say, but what about a professional in the economics field? According to NPR and Time magazine, Trump wants to impose a 10% to 20% tariff on all goods imported into the U.S. and even a 60% tariff on all imports from China. Here's what Dr. Better, an economics professor at Ohio University, thinks about these policies. Well, most economists, and I think I would agree with this, would say that tariffs in general uh, have negative effects on the economy. Uh, because what tariffs do is it raises the price of trading with other nations, makes it more costly, more difficult, and leads to less trade. While Dr. Better sees some negative effects regarding tariffs, he also said there could be some positive effects to the economy regarding Trump's regulation cuts. He also added that every economist has a different opinion regarding Trump's policies. The re reduction in regulations that uh, Trump is proposing that goes along with these tariffs uh, reductions uh, is good. I think Trump is proposing great things. I, I, I have some positive uh, feelings towards some of what Trump is proposing, but specifically on the tariffs themselves. Uh, I, uh, for every economist that I know who thinks it's a good idea, I know at least three or four who would say it's a bad idea. The feelings never before felt by an election seen by those students and a professional economist it will be really interesting to see how all of Donald Trump's policies play out in these next four years. And reporting for Gen Z up to the ballot, I'm Sully Beach. From voter reactions to economics and the president-elect, it all feels like we all have to watch it play out and stay informed. And speaking of being informed after this, Gen Z up to the ballot reporter Sullivan Beach will be coming out with his podcast talking with Gen Zers about what they think the next four years will look like under a Donald Trump presidency. Well, that's all the information we have for you today, post-election edition live from the Schoonover Center. But remember, while we provide facts and opinions at the end of the day, it is up to you to decide. Thank you for tuning in to Gen Z Up to the Ballot, and have a great night. From the Scripps School of Journalism in the Schoonover Center in Athens, Ohio, this is Gen Z Up to the Ballot.